So hello, I'm Eva Pasco, and this is Cyber Salon podcast, uh, the series on Internet Big Bang from 1994 to 1997. And we are delighted to have uh, Wendy Grossman with us. Wendy has been involved in internet for a number of years, and uh, she is going to talk a little bit about the score three years when everything happened. Uh, but just to start inter- on the internet, do you want to introduce yourself, Wendy? Yes, I'm Wendy Grossman. Uh, I started working in technology journalism in 1990 or 91, and that just co- coincidentally around the time that the internet and online services were beginning to really uh, become of interest. And I decided very early on that it was a good area to specialize in because it was clearly the future of communication. So how did you fall into technology? How, how was your technology adventure? What, was, what happened first? Um, that was really because I founded a magazine called The Skeptic about uh, scientific examination of paranormal claims in 1987. And so when I came to London in 1990, I called up everybody who was involved with The Skeptic and said, uh, hi, I'm in town. I live here now. And one of the people said, did I, you know, I said, and I said quite openly, I was looking for work. And one of the people I called said, do you want to write about computers? And I thought, well, that's probably a better choice than a lot of, (laughs) nobody's going to ask me to write about hairstyles. So, um, and I had done a little bit of computer science at Cornell when I was a student. So, you know, it wasn't entirely crazy. And I did actually have an an early computer called the TRS-80 model. So I had some experience, you know. Right, but don't talk about hairdressing because you also support a long hair group online. So you obviously have your area of expertise. <laughs> now they're the experts. I just admire what they do. <laughs> now more more to the point in this country was a service called the CompuLink Information Exchange, which is still in existence and. Uh, runs, you can go to cix.co.uk and you can see it. And that was where everybody was interested in technology. And um, now I was on CompuServe. <laughs> well, a lot of us were on CompuServe as well. I was. Um, but Kix was where all the technology journalists hung out. We had our own conference and we had a conference just that was just journalists and one that was journalists and PRs. And so, you know, it was the technology journalism community then in the UK was a very strong community because we saw each other all the time at press conferences and we saw each other every day online. So it was, uh, it was really good. Everybody helped each other and everybody had helped each other with contacts and things like that. Um, yeah, so the early internet uh, community on Kix was, uh, well, on the bulletin board, was involved in setting up uh, the first internet provider, right? Well, um, Kix wasn't a bulletin board. It was, it was a conferencing system. And one of the conferences, wa- uh, one of, you could, anybody could set up a conference. And so uh, Cliff Stanford one day set up a con- conference called Tenor a Month. And he basically said if he could get, I think it was 100 people might've been more than that, but he had a specific number he needed of people who would promise to pay 10 pounds a month. Uh, and he said, if you got, could get as many, that many, he would, he would set up the service. And so enough, so enough people subscribed in advance for him, for him to, to set it up. And so that, that was amazing the because that, that connected then to us because uh, Demon was uh, uh, probably about 18 months ahead, providing uh, the first internet to the home. Pipex, uh, Pipex was going then too. Uh, Pipex was business to business. They initially right. didn't have a home connection, but when we watched uh, Demon, I thought it was a great idea, but it was so hard to set up. It took forever. Oh, it was insane. It was insane. They were using oh. this, uh, They were using this software called KA9Q, which was written for packet radio. And if you had trouble getting it working, you could call them up and they would like debug it over the phone, <laughs> looking at the actual code. It was, it was completely insane. So we were watching it and we just started uh, Siberia Cafe in, uh, in September 94. And we realized that there was a very big gap in the market for people who didn't want to spend 10 hours 
on the support line to demon. So we created this uh, ISP called EasyNet, uh, which I wouldn't say was easy, but was easier than demon. And that was his unique setting point. And then, you know, my colleague, uh, co-founder from Siberia, Keith T, wrote this book about the EasyNet mm -hmm. way to the net. Somewhere uh, I still have, I still have, I still have a copy of the copy of the copy uh, he was trying to persuade everybody that, you know, obviously that was easier. Uh, but looking at it now, it was still as bloody hard, you know, just a fraction. But we inherited Graham Davies from uh, Demon because he worked with Cliff Stanford. And then we managed to headhunt him and uh, he was uh, EasyNet uh, technical director and it became a great, great friend of mine. So it's definitely a link. EasyNet was founded in 1994 by David Rowe and Keith Tier, and here is David with Ram Davies, who became the CTO. National Portrait Gallery organized an exhibition, The Men Who Killed the Distance, and here is the team, David Rowe, Companions, Tony Ruggiero, Andy Long, and Grand David. Uh, but going back to your adventure on, on kicks, so that obviously got you to uh, join the troops of uh, tech journalists and so uh, uh, do you I remember was, I was a tech journalist and then I joined Kix. I joined Kix because I'd convinced an editor I should review online services. So he could pay for you being on Kix. Well, I got right? paid to join I got paid to join Kix, yes. Oh very good. Uh and do you remember that what was the scene like at that time? Because the London was ahead of US in many ways because we had free uh, telecommunication um, access, not least thanks to the Telecommunication Act of the Regulation. That Online access was very much an expensive proposition in this country because you had to pay by the minute for local calls. So one of the reasons that somebody like Demon could offer 10 pounds a month was that they knew that the cost of being online, they would be paying the phone company per minute to access, you know, because you were dialing up over a modem, that would limit how much time people actually spent using the, the internet service provider. So then you they could afford to promise all you could eat, so to speak. But in the US, um, those local phone calls were free. So it was very much cheaper to use online services at that time in the US. Right, but I think US was uh, hampered by America online. <laughs> so, but you remember what were you covering? What were the key topics? Because you were writing for a lot of people, right? ZDNet for the Guardian. Yeah, and um, yeah, the Guardian and about I don't know if a dozen or something different computer magazines, but most mostly I did a lot. I did some product reviews. I wrote a lot of features and interviews, and uh, I did book reviews. I've always done book reviews. It, one of the differences then was there were a lot more different companies. So you know, if you were doing an interview series like the one I did for Personal Computer World, there were a lot of people to interview. Um, right. So it was uh, this. It wasn't aggregated as it is now. It was right. A lot, the, a lot more. The industry hadn't consolidated yet. So you know, there were dozens. You know, a lot of the computer magazines ran on borrowed equipment, and you know, there were like a dozen or more manufacturers to borrow PCs from. And so they'd get something and they'd run it for a month, and then the PR would take it back, and they'd organize another one from a different company. And they sort of justified it by saying it gave them access to, you know, new equipment and they could keep pace, their knowledge could keep pace with the industry as it changed. And then of course, somewhere around 2000, it just, you know, everybody was just running on computers. And, and um, you know, these days, these days you wouldn't even be, be given a free mobile phone, I don't think. No, no, that, yeah, that started, the, it started closing about 2000, but uh, you're so right, because I remember the first years of Siberia, 94, 99, we practically lived off these launches because, you know, every week there was a launch of new something, if not laptop, then desktop or loads. And then it kind of started calming down a lot as the aggregation started progressing. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about the perception of, of trust in the internet at that time. How did people feel about putting money 
in well the people the remember that the people i knew weren't exactly typical i i didn't know anybody who was really that concerned if the people i knew who were online weren't really that concerned about using a credit card because you were your liability was limited to 50 pounds now we had credit card subscription um in siberia for people to set up Mm -hmm. uh, they half an hour and like every other person say, I'm not going to do it online. I want to give you cash. So we thought, okay, fine. But uh, it was obviously much easier for us if they could do self-service. Uh, but it was a lot of distrust and we were, we spent hours explaining to them SSL and it's all safe and it's encrypted. I think, oh no, I don't know. But you were running a business. I was just sitting in my house writing articles, you know. I, I, you, I don't have the same, I didn't have the same contact with the general public that you Yeah, I, I think it started changing about 97, 98, where, where obviously Amazon was around then by, since 94. So, so internet bookshop was around and people started trusting the computers a bit more. But the first few years were difficult. Uh, but what made you think about the conflicts? Because your great book, uh, networks, which were published in 97, uh, address that whole area of change from the early collaborative computing to the conflicts of uh, proprietary nature of new gov of new. I think a lot of it came from I started going to the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference in 1994. And that was kind of the focus of the conference was areas where the um, physical, well, the, the world we knew and the world that was coming with the internet were in conflict and it struck me as an interesting, it's an interesting area to explore. So I used to tell people that I wrote, write about the border wars between cyberspace and real life, but there's, you know, anybody under 40, that doesn't mean anything to them because they think cyberspace is, is real life, you know, they, they don't, they're never offline because their phone is always connected. Right, so it's not like it was for us where you had to wait for the modem to connect and you really had the sense that you were going someplace different. It's just not yeah. like that anymore. Yes, I think that the shift was the early, the mid nineties where you went online to find your online friends because your everyday friends were not online. Right. And by 97, 98, most of my friends from, from university, from work were online. Well, it's our own fault because we spent a lot of time telling all our friends they should get online. And then once they were there, we realized we had recreated our quiet. actual lives and it was stupid. We should have, you know. And you mentioned Scientology was the big issue. Oh, that, no, that was just one particularly big conflict that I wrote about. Um, you know, I could sort of see the first time I saw the uh, uh, alt.religion.scientology news group, I just knew with the amount of science fiction fans that were online that there was going to be a big fight because Scientologists are not inclined to let people uh, throw mud at them, you know. Right, so that was conflict over the address, right? So that, was a, that was a big article that I did for Wired. Yeah, uh, and then you also wrote a lot about the, the um, intellectual property uh, and the- Yeah, yeah. yeah that was quite, I think it was quite important before there was such a free for all on internet domains that anybody would could register, you know, Levi.com yeah, and but play with it. And then it started. You still, can't, you still can't copyright an internet domain. No, but, uh, but then that, that uh, bigger brand power started emerging. Mm. Uh, and I think by 98, if you had um, brand registered offline, you could reclaim your name. Uh, like Levi.com and that, that started. I don't, not, not universally. I mean, you'd have to go to dispute re resolution because, you know, if some business came along now and said their name was pelicancrossing.net or there's or said their name was Pelican Crossing, I'm sorry, I've had pelicancrossing.net since 1996. They don't get to take it away from me just because that's their business name. And McDonald's, I think, fought, didn't McDonald's fight with the clan? Oh, that was about a restaurant. Um, yes, Patagonia I, has been a ha, was a big fight also because Patagonia, the clothing manufacturer and the Amazon felt that it had some rights to the name. Yes, that or, or the um, island. Do you remember Tuvalu Island, which registered .tv? Yeah, and all the TV ch it makes it makes a huge percentage of its uh, gross domestic product from television companies registered there.
Yeah, I looked them up once, and you know, it's a tiny island with one palm tree, so good for them. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's nice that they're getting some revenue from that. Uh, but what signals made you write that book? Because it was a very important book, and in a way, Canary in the Mines. The standard, the standard internet book of the time was more like a travel guide and on the sort of assumption that the people who were writing them had explored the internet and the people who were reading them either hadn't or, or were never going to. You know, like I say, they were more like travel guides. I don't think there was anything, you know, I think the reason Net Wars happened was uh, I was kind of jealous of all these people writing internet books. And there was a guy on the Usenet news group rec.sport.tennis who one day popped up and said, what does everybody do here when you're not watching tennis? I'm a publisher. <laughs> so, so I immediately responded, well, some of us are freelance writers who would like to publish books. <laughs> and so uh, he and I, you know, I, he said, well, what do you want to write? And I said, well, you know, I want to write about, you know, the internet. And I, I don't know, I, I I guess I said something about net wars and conflicts and, and he commissioned the book, you know, so that was how that went. But it was quite amazing because that book came out in print and online with the hypertext connected and you had like 500 links in that book. And that was probably one of the first books that were published in both formats. I can't remember anybody earlier. Um, Bruce Sterling was first. Bruce Sterling published The Hacker Crackdown as a book and he retained, because you could still do that then, he retained, retained the electronic rights and because he thought it would have a short shelf life and he wanted it read in a lot of places, he published it online as a text file and so it, it got read in a lot of countries where it would never have been published. Right. Um, well, he, was, he was first and I think, Net, I think Net Wars was either second or third. Cory Doctorow got a lot of credit for publishing one of his, his first books online for free. And I had to kind of tell him that Net Wars was in before him. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, Cory likes the credit. credit. Got all the credit. But um, I remember, you know, the, um, the internet provider that David Bowie was running called Bowie Net. Uh, Bowie was putting a lot of his uh, samples, a lot of uh, bits of his uh, material on that Bowie net and he said in the early interview that he always understood that internet will be about sampling by fans mm. and artists will just provide guidance um, so I think he was doing similar stuff in the area of music and sort of pioneering that we ended up doing interviews with him in Siberia and I always thought that he was one of the most insightful people about copyrights and how it that pan out. There's been some quotes of his that have been recirculated in the last couple of years and they do seem quite prescient. Yeah, uh, but coming back to the book, uh, you were you were talking also about sex and porn and uh, the usual drivers. Everybody was talking about sex and porn at that time. Well, it always drives technology and, you know, sex, porn and sport. But what was your, your concern at that time? What were you picking up? Um, mostly that I thought, um, I thought people were getting, worrying about it way too much and that we were, you know, getting legal approaches that were, you know, bad for free speech, you know, because people were sort of panicked about porn. Actually, the one thing I kind of hoped would happen was that amateur porn would, would make it harder for the commercial industry to survive. <laughs> You know, because I saw, I saw the commercial industry as, as exploitive and I hoped that amateur porn wouldn't be. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it's worked out in any good way really though. No, probably not, probably not. But coming back to your argument, uh, so you were sort of arguing very much for preservation of freedom of speech and you were on the side of maintaining open framework as much as possible. Yeah which at that time, a lot of people were opposed and they were- Not among the people, not among the people I knew though. I mean, the people who go to, who went to computers, freedom and privacy or that I saw online, most of them were, you know, most of them had the sense that we had this very special kind of space and that, you know, governments weren't gonna come in and, and there's a great quote, uh, William Heath, uh, who was a good friend of Anthony Jay, who was one of the writers of Yes Minister. Um, Showed, showed Anthony Jay the internet and, and Jay looked at it and he, was, he said, that's very interesting. I wonder what they're going to do to screw it up. 
<laughs> you know, he just had this, I, you know, he had this immediate idea that government would get their hands on it and, and want to control it because governments want to control things. And, you know, we're still seeing that sort of battle now. And some of it has changed because right now the governments are focused on controlling Facebook and Google and Apple and so on. And that's not really controlling the internet. So maybe we can hope that that this just distracts them for a while. We can I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I keep thinking about it because when we started uh, EasyNet back in 94, you know, the first thing we got was visits from sad looking people from the government wanting to put backdoor uh, for the network room and having access to whatever was going on on it. Not much was going on, but whatever it was, they wanted to have access to. And since then, you know, government always wanted to control the content. But when we asked, you know, what is this, what you want us to control, give us a list and then, you know, we will try to implement. And they never did. And every now and then it comes back, but you know when it comes when the chips are down, the governments can't actually don't want to formulate what it is what they want to control, and the internet providers don't particularly want to be liable for content they carry, and it just goes around in circles all the way back to 1994. So I don't really think that's gonna get resolved, because who would be you know who would want to make the decision? I mean, no government wants to make the decision. No, but the big thing that's changed since then is you had several hundred dial-up ISPs in Britain at the height, and now you have six offering consumer broadband. Yeah, well, Maybe it's really hard because yeah, some of them are just multi-brands of the same owner. Right. Yes, but, uh, but ultimately, uh, the opportunity now is in fragmentation of the networks, like over the last three weeks, I think everybody I know has moved either to Telegram or to Signal or to Stereo or TikTok. People just dispersing, and you my, always... my niece, my niece complained this called me this morning, and she wanted to know why I didn't have an iPhone. I said, Why should I have an iPhone? I have an Android. What's an Android? <laughs> you so know, you can't, can't join Clubhouse. You can send me messages, you can send email, you can make phone calls, you can send text messages, use Signal, use something. You know, I just can't get iMessage because I don't have an iPhone. But she seemed to take this as a personal insult. And that's that's why people are now uh, objecting to Clubhouse because Clubhouse is iPhone only. It's iPhone only and it's also audio only. And I don't think people have thought about the consequence. You know, the, the internet really opened up communication for deaf people. Right, because you could participate in a public forum on an equal basis if you were typing. Yeah. And Clubhouse takes it away again. Yes, accessibility is not a strong point of Clubhouse. But you were arguing, going back to the book, about uh, the need for smaller virtual communities because internet communities don't scale. Do you want to talk about it? Um, it's just once you get to a certain number of people, unless you have uh, human moderation, you know, sort of in proportion to the number of people you have, which apparently Clubhouse is trying to do, which is, which is good. Um, you, you just can't, you, there's always abuse. Uh, you know, there's always, there's always some little creep who wants to come in and spoil the party and thinks it's just hilariously funny to do so. What they fear is that if you use voice, people are less likely to be obnoxious. So let's see. That's a we'll see yeah. when they get to a certain number of people. I'm not I'm not sure that that's going to be true. Yeah, I think they're limiting rooms to five thousand. So maybe that is the size of the community where you can just about keep an eye. I on. bet it's really difficult to have a conversation with five thousand people, though. How do you tell who's speaking? Uh, it's highly moderated, so so you get you get invited who is speaking. It's yeah, mm -hmm. it's much much tighter moderated than another medium. We'll see how it pans out. I wish them all the best because I think that diversification is good. Uh, I, AOL used to have a chat room limit of twenty three people, and Lawrence Lessig in uh, in his book Code Is Law said you couldn't organize it. You couldn't organize a protest movement that way. And he was talking about the way the architecture of the online space can limit what you can do in it. Yeah, so that's interesting. Could you organize a protest movement on Clubhouse if each room is limited to 5,000 people? I don't think Clubhouse is an activist platform. I think it's, you know, fundraising and startup -y and being smart ass about the future of the internet and who's going to make money on it first. And there's more Bitcoin rooms than you can swing a cat up. 
No, so you're I'm making not, me. You're making me feel that I'm not missing anything by I not. I don't expect anything. that to be a, an agent of change unless it's a fintech change. Uh, but going back to your your interest in uh, digital rights, you were involved in the Open Rights Group, and you are the advisory member. I, I've been on the advisory council since close, pretty close to when it started. So um, I was a, I was at the early meetings where they were trying to define what it was going to do. Yeah, and and what was the main driving power behind it? Was it was it into in response to specific legislation issue? No, it was no, it was uh, it, well, it was one of the co summer coding events. Uh, there there were a couple of I think it was open open tech I think it was, um, and. Danny O'Brien, who's now with EFF, uh, was doing a panel with a couple of other people, and he rashly said that if they could get, I forget what the number was, X number of people to promise to pay five pounds a month, they would start the Open Rights Group. And the reason was, basically, the panel was on why doesn't the UK have an organization like EFF? Right. And Danny kept saying he didn't think it was possible. So he challenged the audience to come up with enough people who would promise to pay five pounds a month and enough people showed up. And so like a month and a half later, he, he found Sue Charman and she did all the bootstrapping work to get it started. It's a great organization. And you know, I'm glad in a way, I was surprised at the beginning that they've chosen to go their own way because EFF was already quite well established, but uh, I think it's retained its integrity in the UK specific way. So that was probably a good, good call. Well, but a lot of the stuff EFF does in the US can't really be done the same way here. Um, EFF does a lot of legal cases and so on. And the potential, the, the legal structure that would allow an organization to represent a class of people complaining about something isn't really the same here. In fact, it hasn't existed really. So um, it was going to always going to kind of have to be a different organization. And what, was surprising is, what was surprising is how long it took Liberty to come on board with digital rights. Yes, because Liberty could have right. Liberty if Liberty had started on it in 1994. I'm not sure that Open Rights Group would ever have existed, or if it had, it would be doing different things. Well, I remember that the fights about third party cookies that started erupting about 97 and we asked Liberty to intervene because to me it was clearly uh, infringement of uh, individual digital privacy and they didn't really have. No, it, privacy, or, had to to privacy yeah. international at that time. Yeah. Uh, but going back to the early, to the mid 90s, 97, who, who of the journalists at that time you, you think was uh, the most influential uh, in defining the consensus of taking the right of the human over the right of the commercial? Charles Arthur, for example, who's still around. Um, where was he in the early 90s? He was, Guardian? He was at the Guardian? no, he wasn't. I don't think he was at the Guardian. He was at the, I think he was at the Independent at that point. Um, and um, Ben Ben Rooney, starting in 1997 to about 2001, ran the connected section for the Daily Telegraph. And they basically took over all the stuff Wired UK, because there was a briefly an edition, a UK edition of Wired. And when Wired got got into financial trouble because it couldn't run its IPO as it had planned, and it shut down the UK uh, magazine in order to save money. Um, ben Rooney sent out a thing saying, send me all your wired ideas. <laughs> so, so um, you know, so Ben Ben did a lot. Of, Tom Standage, who is now at The Economist, was terrific on all, on all those topics because he was, he was always ahead on what was going on. Um, Jack Schofield, who then edited the computer page at The Guardian. Uh, Guy Cuny, who wrote Technology News for, for a couple of decades. Uh, he was probably not as well known, to, you know, he didn't write for newspapers, but he was very influential within the technology journalist scene. Um, yeah, I wrote for the Independent for the technology section for about eight years, and they were very cutting edge. So they were letting me complain and rant about Microsoft before anybody else decided mm -hmm. that Microsoft was the bad noir of the tech environment. They were, they were quite 
quite critical of the large technical companies. They were not worried about advertising. Everybody else was worried about advertising, uh, particularly Daily Mail, who had never let me write anything against Microsoft because it was one of the biggest advertisers. So it was interesting to see that UK journalists were allowed to be quite as critical because for a long time, Microsoft was fed feeding all the media with the ad budget. Yeah, but there were other software companies at the time too. Microsoft wasn't as, you know, it wasn't as dominant, in a way it wasn't as dominant a com company as it is now. But the other thing I was going to say was that um, I, don't, I don't know how many of the journalists in the technology journalists in the 90s were really terribly influential because we were all writing for sort of little ghettoized areas. We were writing for the computer page or the computer magazine. We weren't writing... You know, I, I really feel that it wasn't until technology journalism moved on to the front pages and the news desk and so forth uh, with people like Carol Kidwallader and Hale Hodson, who's at The Economist. Um, Which is relatively recent, right? It's about 2014, 15, really. Yeah, no, that's much later. I mean, that's what I'm saying is it's, I think it was much later that you started to get real influence over what was going on, you know, because you know, in the, in the mid 90s, what were you writing? You, you know, I, I wrote one of the first two or three articles in this country about how to how to make your own web page. Well, you, who do you think read that? A bunch of geeks. Yeah. I remember because we started uh, the HTML training course for women in uh, mid, in kind of like of October 94. And I ran the course for women, but uh, basically a lot of guys came and brought the girlfriend just to cover up because they actually wanted to learn. Because at that time, nobody really knew how to make your They didn't own. want to admit they didn't know. Yeah, and uh, Keith Tier, who was our co-founder, uh, was running his training sessions for business, and people just were desperate to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, but it took quite a long time for that to go mainstream, so that was very early days. But going back to the influential journalists, uh, Charles R. Arthur, so what do you think was your, your his view of where the... Uh, independent internet sat versus the large company push to control and close it? Um, well, Charles masterminded uh, open an open our data campaign at The Guardian um, to get data sets that were created with taxpayer money opened for public use. So so I think Open Data Institute was aiming All Right. To well, Charles started his campaign before that existed. Yeah, but I think he was influencing that funding because I think I think I think his I think that you know I think that was definitely an influential uh, campaign. Yeah, I quite liked the work and I was very supportive of that at the beginning, particularly because it had terrific people on it. But I think they were pushed to uh, take a view of search where open data could be, and then find a partner to lock it and sell it for a lot of money. So most of the activity that was coming out of uh, of the open data somehow usually ended up as closed data. And I watch it now, you know, in my space, in the retail space, footfall for a while was open data and then somebody figure out how to close it. Uh, on, the, on the concept of uh, campaigning against uh, abuse of digital rights, uh, you've been writing about the facial recognition and the uh, uh, surveillance in the cities. The automated facial recognition really is a step change in terms of surveillance because, you know, before you could you could avoid a camera maybe, or you could you could decide you could you know you could not go to certain websites, or you could run an ad blocker, or you could do something, but you can't really go out without your face, and so it changes surveillance from sort of patchy and maybe it's there and maybe it isn't to being this unavoidable passive thing that's going to happen all the time. And so I regard that as really dangerous. And I think a lot of people do. I'm not, I'm not unique in that. Yeah, I think that even people who don't care about, uh, you know, putting the uh, Facebook security status on private versus public and leave the data all over, they, they take uh, a serious, serious exception to facial recognition in towns because I think people have quite good sense that you might be, there's a lot of false positives and you might be recognized to be in a place that you haven't been. It's actually an interesting thing to think about. Is it worse that it's terribly inaccurate now and you get all these false matches that fall 
um, disproportionately on non-white people? Or will it be worse when it's accurate and, and accurately targeted and enables specific people to be harassed and targeted maybe unfairly and they can do it with pinpoint precision? There is, a, there is inaccuracy and there is a social issue shouldn't even be there in the first place. Yeah, and I think we should focus on the social issue that it shouldn't be there in the first place because I think it'll be worse for, for the people it's bad for, it will be worse for when it's accurate. Yeah, but the risk is that, you know, that technology is so cheap because the camera is cheap because all the work is done offline, all the work is done on the cloud. So you need like absolutely nothing to, to carry the actual capturing because all the processing is offline. And that just makes so tempting, you know, every tiny big organization and every small dictator to put it on every lamppost as they attempt. So I think that's going to be a very big battle. Uh, but just to finish off, so in terms of the adventures from sort of 94, 97, uh, what do you think we can learn from it? And what are the lessons that we can still apply in 21st century? Well, you could say that the big mistake we made um, was allowing everything to centralize. Uh, you know, we started out with a cooperative web and an open and an open a cooperative internet and an open web. And um, very early on, EFF faced was trying to campaign for symmetric uh, broadband connections to each house instead of having a skinny connection going up and a fat connection coming down, which is what we we generally have. They they were arguing for a fat connection in both directions so that people could be both consumers and producers. And then somebody came up with a web farm and EFF kind of gave up on the idea. And so we made, you know, ISPs started handing out email. ISPs could have chosen to give you the wherewithal to set up your own mail server, but instead they gave you an email address. You know, there were lots of these decisions that were made for various kinds of commercial reasons. The ISP wanted the advertising of having their, their name on your email. And there were, you know, and so we sort of, it was convenient, it was easier to use centralized services, and then the centralized services became big companies, and then now we have Facebook and Google, you know, each generation of centralized services became easier to use, but more controlling and more invasive, till we reach now. Yes, there's a terrible price to pay for convenience. But the other part of it is that when the mobile world joined the internet, the mobile world never had a tradition of an open internet. It was always closed. And so it brought with it this presumption that everything was going to be closed and controlled and walled gardens and so forth. And so there's, you know, you can still take a mobile phone and use a browser and go to any part of the web you want, but it's, it's a little more awkward than using an app and people tend, you know, and, but an app puts you in a little walled garden that's carefully curated and maximally invasive. So, you know, these are choices. And uh, you have yeah, to make so, so that brings us back to open source and, you know, supporting uh, efforts of the communities that uh, provide tools and software that people can use to build alternatives to those things. I mean, the hope is that, you know, the, the disaggregation of social media that's going on now might just take us out of the control of the big companies. We couldn't achieve it through regulation, but maybe we'll achieve it through disaggregation. It's not clear, to, but it's not clear to me that it is disaggregating because um, you know Facebook is kind of merging the databases that of, of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Uh, right, but people are moving to Signal and Telegram and Stereo and TikTok. So you know, by by nature of how easy it is to set up a, a platform it would be more and more of them. And well, some people are moving, but I don't think the mainstream is moving. You know, like my tennis club, for example, I tried to get them on Signal last year. They want to use WhatsApp. And I sort of explained, but WhatsApp belongs to Facebook. We could have a more privacy protect. Yeah, but my school group uses WhatsApp. So I'm moving to Telegram. So, you know, there is hope. So thank you very much, Wendy, for your help. And thank you for finding time for us. It's a privilege to have you here and hopefully we can reconvene in the episode three. Thank you.